You may be seated.
you watch the news, if you uh, read the newspapers, if you listen to any podcasts or anything, you will hear that there is an ongoing attack. I believe that it is the responsibility of the Christian church, the evangelical church, to stand with the nation of Israel. Amen. Now that doesn't mean that that we're going to uh, endorse everything that they do. My wife doesn't endorse everything I do. <laughs> but there are some clear promises from God when you stand with the nation of Israel, when you stand with the chosen people. Amen. So it is, it is our position as a denomination, the Church of God, it is our position as a local body within that denomination to stand and pray for Israel, to stand with Israel. So as your pastor, I'm going to ask you to do that throughout uh, the weeks, throughout the months. Pray for Israel. Pray for your leadership. Pray that a revival will sweep across that nation and that they will know Jesus as their Lord and Savior just as we do. Amen. And also pray that these attacks against them, both politically and physically, will cease. Amen? Can we do that? Before we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, i got a couple of real quick prayer requests. Remember, Glenn is speaking. He's a, he's a friend of Cherie's. He's got some blood clots in his body. He needs the Lord to touch. Uh, there's several people in our congregation, several members of our family of faith that are they're struggling with some things this week. We want to remember uh, Gail Nebbit. We want to remember uh, Jackie uh, Luce. We want to remember Kathy Hamilton and her family. I'll, I'll be preaching uh, Kathy's mom's funeral this afternoon. So we want to remember all of them and so many other requests. But you know what's amazing? Our God hears and knows every need that we have. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We worship you. We praise your holy name. Lord, we know that there is no need that we have, no situation that we face that is beyond you. Your, your word tells us that you know, you hear, you see, you feel what we are feeling. And Lord, right now, I, I, I stand on the promises of your word. I stand on the promise of healing, Lord, for those that need to be healed. I stand on the promise of restoration for those that need uh, to be restored, Lord, those that need miracles to happen in their life. And Lord, I, I pray that right now as we stand up for the nation of Israel, we stand with the nation of Israel, Lord, that you will send the people into our government that will be empowered to protect your chosen people. Lord, I ask that you will have your way in this service, that you will have your way with me today. Lord, let the Holy Spirit lead and guide. And in your holy, holy, holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Got a couple real quick announcements. I think Bud's got one as he comes forward. I want to remind you about the, the sign-up cards and the things that are in the pew there in front of you. Uh, if you are interested in being part of any ministry of the church, please fill this card out and let us know. Uh, we're, we're adding some ministry teams where we're pulling some teams together, and we're excited about that. If this is your first time with us today or your first time in a long time, first of all, welcome home. And second of all, please fill this card out so we can follow up with you. And then even more importantly, if you need some prayer, if you need somebody to pray with you, fill this card out and let us know, and we will call you back, and we will be praying for you. As a matter of fact, I didn't tell them I was going to do this, so I'm going to embarrass four people real quick. Uh, our, our, uh, I'm calling it our connection team, but our follow-up team, uh, Loie, stand up please, Mick, Dan, and Elizabeth. This is our, our connection team, and come on, give my hand for that prayer. We're going to be calling, calling up and, and reaching out to our first-time uh, visitors and to those that are needing prayer, praying with folks. So we're we excited about what God is doing and going to do through us. And if you would like to join that team, fill out that card, and I'll get it to Loey or, or Dan, and they'll follow up with you. Brother Bud, come and make your announcement.
Do you want me to take the offer or not? If you want to. Okay. <laughs> Since your voice is bad. Thank you. Yeah. My voice is bad. This is a screeching. Oh, is that what it is? Oh, he has to figure it out. I just, real quick, I just want to remind everybody that Winter Jam is just in a few weeks. If you are going to go with us, Angie is not like the rest of us. So we have to leave at 9 o'clock in the morning. We're going to stop and get a bite to eat and then go and hang out and wait the line all day. Yay! <laughs> That's if you want to go with me. We've got plenty of rides. We'll take care of it. And remember, please, if, if money is an issue, just let us know. We'll, we will find a way. This morning, I'm going to make an announcement. I came in at Christmas time. We're going to have pastor appreciation. It's seven. Picture uh, made it up fair enough. But we're going to have pastor appreciation April seven because uh, I wanted to do it before uh, Lovey and I leave for, two, for the summer. Yeah, we have two months. Uh, and uh, there's a sign up sheet I call Prime Servo. I know it doesn't do a lot of you, but. They have the biggest room, and they're gracious to uh, <coughs> let me have it whenever I call them. So there's a sign-up sheet I need to call them, and there's a sign-up sheet for homecoming out there, too. You need to sign it so we know how many that we're expecting down at the farm show building uh, for homecoming. And don't forget to come for homecoming. Uh, I'll take you all from Mom up here. Uh, we need a candy bar. What kind of candy bar do you like? Huh? Snickers. Snickers. See, I like this one. It's like a hamburger. You go somewhere and get a hamburger, you know, and you bite into it and it just runs down all over you. I like it. And uh, anyway, uh, we've been teaching the kids uh, different lessons with candy. So, you know, just think in two months your kids are sugar cow will fall because they won't be any more candy. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, uh, did you ever think of it? Nest is crunch. I mean, I told the kids, I'm going to win this one because it's the biggest one. Check that out. That's the biggest candy bar. The kids have to know uh, what the story is about and tell me at the end of our 12 weeks, and they can choose a candy bar. So this is my candy bar. I'm not letting the kids out. I'm not teaching them. But anyway, you, but you, you know what's in a, in, in a Nestle's Crunch Bar? Rice Krispies. You bite into it, you can hear it snap, crackle. You know, it's an unexpected feeling you get when you bite into a Nestle's Crunch Bar. See, that's what God is. God blesses us, and he expects us to tell everybody about our blessings. Like the Israelites. Remember the Israelites were... Uh, when Moses let them out and they got trapped at the Red Sea and they didn't know what they was going to do and Moses stuck up that stick <coughs> water part and probably uh, I'd say there probably had to be about 7 million of them because you figure if there were 650 guys there were 650 women and I don't know how many kids they had so I'd say it's pretty close 7 million people across you know what they did when they got on the other side Moses stuck that thing back and it wiped all the Egyptians away. You know. But the, you know, God kept telling them, don't go to Egypt. Don't go to Egypt. You know, so many of us, we like to go to Egypt. We like to bring the past. Egypt. But anyway, when he got over on the other side, Moses stretched the cross and he closed on the Egyptians and the Pharaoh, they started praising God and singing. That's what we're supposed to do after. A great <coughs> or a great blessing. You know, sometimes it's through finances, sometimes it's through a healing, sometimes it's through anything. I can tell you three things that happened in the last three months, uh, last two months. I was down in Virginia, and uh, for some reason it pumped four to six inches of snow within an hour. <coughs> and they robbed me. So it's telling me to go across 58. You know, you're down at uh, uh, Bristol. 58 takes you over. Every dead got a mountain there is. I mean, 
Every time I'm going around the turn, I pray that I can take the tail lights off the back end of my tree. And the third trip around, I thought it was eternal. I thought I was going to die. Because all I could see was that truck going out over that hill. And uh, I was praying to God, and God got me through there. I said, I'd have quit. <laughs> I was so goddamn mad, I could have quit. And uh, anyway, uh, the other week I was going to uh, Delaware. The other Wednesday, when you close church down, because you got that eight inches of snow. In Pennsylvania, for some reason, everyone's just sissies. They close the highways down now. I mean, as soon as we get a duck gun, skip the snow, they're closing the interstate. No truck can run. But I, I, I beat it to Delaware. I'm unloaded. I started back, and I got to the Bay Bridge. And it started to snow. It took me two hours to get to the ball. Two hours. That's a ball. But anyway, I was coming up in 70, and, and it was still snowing and snowing. And I got up about a half of town, and I said, Lord, I rebuked this duck on snow. I am sick of it. <laughs> and I kept rebuking it. And all at once, it was right up. There was nothing to cry. It's all day life. And uh, the other day, I went to North Carolina. And I uh, made a drop in uh, States. <coughs> and I walked around my truck. And I noticed my front tire was like, well, I thought it was bad. I didn't think nothing of it. So I beat it back up to Mount Jackson the other day. And uh, I got to Mount Jackson. I would walk around going on my tracks. I said, I think I've got a tire So I got Gage out check it. I had 40 pounds of air in it. 40 pounds of air. So I take it down and pop it up about 100 pounds. And I back up in another spot and get ready to go to bed. And, and I was out checking all the chickens. <coughs> got 52 chicken lights. 52 lights. I want everybody to see me when I drive. But I got down there. And and, and I seen all these silver things in my car. There was five or six of them. I run over a pound of nails. And I thank God that I didn't pull that tire. Because you know, I'm about 70 miles an hour. I got 80,000 then. But I thank the good Lord. See, they're a miracle. Unexpected like the Nestle's Crunch. Now, when you eat a Nestle's Crunch from now on, just think the unexpected miracle. Hey, the ushers can come up. That's all my stories. I can tell you the other them. They are good. Lord is great. I give him the credit and blessings. Lord, Heavenly Father, we come to your God. God, to thank you that we can stand up here and testify your glory and in your victory, Lord God. God, we. Also, I want to thank you for the music today, Lord. It's a blessing too, Lord God. God and the Word that we brought forth too, Lord God. But most of all, the offerings just as important as the uh, uh, Word, the songs, the testimonies, Lord God. God, we ask you all to bless us, Lord God. Use us, Lord, in your name, Lord God. God, bless those that don't have it. That, that you give them a good financial job. They can bless you and stand up and testify on your behalf. We want to thank you, Lord, for this offering today. We need to use it in your glory and your way. In your name.
and to come and, and Joel does great work. I mean, he's taking some pictures of us and I even look good in it. So he does great work. So I encourage you to come and, and, and let, let him do that. I want to apologize for my voice, but I believe that God's going to give me the strength to, to get through this. Um, there's a lot going on this weekend, and I rebuke the enemy that is trying to silence my voice this morning. Now, we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects this morning, Jesus Christ. Amen? I uh, spent some time uh, several years ago with the... Uh, uh, an older minister, he was well into his 80s. And, uh, he had preached all over the globe. And, and uh, I asked him, I said, if you could go back and do it all over again, what would you do? And uh, he called me, son. I like it when old ministers call me son. He said, son, if I had it all over to do, all, all over to do again or to do it all over again, he said, I would preach one thing. Every Sunday, I preach Jesus Christ, Him crucified. <clears throat> he said, I wouldn't preach topical messages. I wouldn't try to get cutesy. I would just preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's the message of the gospel, isn't it? It's Jesus Christ. Without Him, there is nothing else. So we have this knowledge and we have this This gift that Christ has given to us, this gift of salvation. And then with this gift comes an instruction. What is that instruction? To share. Right? Go into all the world. So this morning we're going to look at that instruction. We're going to look at Jesus Christ and what he says to us. Now, Several people have, have asked me over the last couple of months, listen, if you were uh, talking to a brand new Christian or somebody that was interested in reading the Word, what, what book of the Bible would you tell them to start with? And I always tell them to start with the book of John. It's my favorite book in the Bible. It, it really gets right to the, the heart of who Jesus Christ is. And it gets right to the heart of the Gospel. It's just it's such a loving book. And in the, the Gospel of John, it opens with this dramatic passage right there in the very beginning about the, the divinity, the in, incarnation, and the mission uh, of, of the Word of God. John declares that the Word is co-eternal with God. He, he has always been in, and always will be in that the Word, which is Jesus Christ, was not a created being. He is a forever being. We learn that all things were created by the Word and that He is the source of all life. And we learn that the Word became incarnate as human, as a human, to dwell among His creation. And that all that believe in His name, that call upon His name, will become His children. Now in these few verses, John paints his picture of a, the true nature of God's promised Messiah. And he tells us that Jesus loves us. And he tells us that the Messiah is Jesus Christ. And the Messiah means the anointed one. He is this great uh, expected leader. The leader that the, the, the children of Israel have been looking for. And that he's there to reestablish the kingdom. So the, the religious leaders of the day were looking for that leader. And this guy comes on the scene named John the Baptist. I don't know how well John the Baptist will be received in our churches today. Somebody eating locusts. Looks like he needs a bath. Well, I don't think he'd get many votes as pastor of the year. But he's this charismatic guy, and so when the religious leaders see him, they start to worry. They start to question what's going to happen. And, then, and they get curious, is this the guy that could be the Messiah that we're looking for? Stay with me if you will, please. I'm going to read nine real quick verses, and then I'm going to let you sit down, and I'm just going to talk to you for a few minutes. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. 
So you've got John the Baptist here, the, and he's just come out of the wilderness. He's uh, eating locusts and honey and got animal skins on his clothing. And he's got a group of disciples with him. And, and the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples when he saw Jesus passing by and he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and noticed them following him, he asked them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And then verse 39, come and you'll see, he replied. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about 10 in the morning. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard John and followed him. He first found his own brother, Simon, and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means anointed one. And he brought Simon to Jesus when Jesus saw him, he said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called uh, Caiaphas. I mispronounced that. Cephas. I'm sorry. Which means rock. The next day he decided to leave for Galilee. Uh, Jesus found Philip and told him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and so did the prophets, Jesus, the son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathanael asked him. Come and see, it, said Philip. <laughs> the Heavenly Father, I pray that you will anoint these next few minutes, that you will anoint my voice, you will anoint our ears to hear your word, and to receive your message. And the Lord of the Holy Spirit will have his way with us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So John's standing there with a couple of his disciples. And he sees Jesus walk up and he says, That's him. That's the Messiah. That's the one that we're supposed to follow. And so two of his disciples start to walk behind Christ, and Christ notices them, and he turns, and, and they ask him, where are you staying? I think that's an interesting question, isn't it? Where do you live? What are you doing? Who are you? Where are you staying? Now Jesus could have stood there right in the middle of the road and give them a PhD level dissertation on the coming gospel. Right? He could have downloaded every word of the Bible that was yet to come and tried to teach it to them right there in the middle of the road. But instead of doing that, he said, come and see. Don't just take my word for it. Don't just listen to even what John, your, 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 your disciple, your leader has said to you. Come and see for yourself who I am. And judge for yourself if the words that John has just spoken are true. That I am the Messiah, that I am the anointed one. One of those disciples that followed Jesus that morning and asked that question was Andrew, who became one of the original twelve. Now then the first thing that he did after meeting Jesus was run to tell his big brother, Simon Peter, listen, Peter, I have met this guy. And he's the one. He's the one. He, he has changed my view of the world in one day. Now the very next day, this pattern is repeated when Jesus finds Philip. Invite Philip to follow him. Then Philip, recognizing who Christ is, that he is the Messiah, immediately runs to Nathaniel. 
And he invites him to come along with him. Listen, I don't know much about this. I, I've just met him today, but, but man, I'm telling you, this guy Jesus of Nazareth, he's the guy. He's the Messiah. He's the one. Come with me. And Nathaniel, you know, wanted to be a little bit of a wisecracker. We don't know any wisecrackers, do we? He says, can anything good come out of that town? Come on. And then Philip says, listen, all I know is what I've seen. Come with me. Let's see it together. Now that pattern has been repeated for two plus thousand years. Somebody who has met Jesus tell somebody who hasn't met Jesus all about him and invites this new person to come to a place with them so that they can encounter Christ together. Now that new person then recognizes Jesus for who he is, the, the Lamb of God, the Messiah, the personal Savior, our soon coming King, the, this new person recognizes Jesus, they start to follow Jesus, and then they immediately go start telling other people. And invite Jesus, or invite those people in to see Jesus. Now this is a very simple blueprint, a very simple concept, but it communicates a profound expectation for all of us who, follow, who call ourselves followers of Christ. If we want to be true disciples of Jesus Christ, and I believe that fundamentally all Christians do, we have to embrace this idea, this reality, that we're supposed to go tell people about Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, Pastor, that's that's scary. We do it every day of our life. We tell people about something. I got this brand new blender. <laughs> it chops, it mixes, it does other blendery stuff, and it does it at 100 miles an hour, and you know, you put the lid on it, and it's just like, boom! It's amazing, you gotta go get a new blender. Talk to my wife for two minutes, and she'll sing the praises of um, Ned. It was Ned. Ned is our remote control vacuum cleaner. It comes in vacuums, you know, you program it, and you have to be there. It undocks itself, vacuums the living room, comes back, self-docks, lets the kids leave a stuffed animal on the floor, and then it kind of sits on top of the stuffed animal and yells for help. <laughs> Andre's probably sold more Neds than any other Ned salesperson. Get a new truck. Man, the Ford F-150, it's amazing. First on race day, right? Ford. Okay. Chevy, Silverado. Do we have a ton? Anyway. But we do that. We tell people about things that we're excited about. Church, somewhere along the line, we stopped being excited about Jesus Christ. That blows my mind. The only hope for this world is Jesus Christ. Amen. Not a new blender, not a brick truck, not a vacuum cleaner. Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah, we will stay silent. Oh, dear Lord, help me. Man. Not the metal here. We will have people that will sing the praises of these Easter eggs that we sell more than they'll Sing the praises of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. Now, go sell the eggs. It's great. I'm excited about it. But no Easter egg saved my soul. No Easter egg is coming back to call me home. No Easter egg is preparing a place for me right now in heaven. Now, Jesus, he had a lot to say about finding the lost people. As a matter of fact, 
Luke chapter 15, a lot of people refer to that as the lost chapter. He, he shares this parable about the lost sheep. And, and I'm sure you're familiar with this story if you've been in the children's church or Sunday school. In this parable, Jesus tells the story of a shepherd who has 100 sheep. And he loses one of them. And so the shepherd leaves the 99 and he goes out and he finds the one. And he, he brings that one back into the fold. That is a representation of the church. How many people have been here but are now no longer going to church anywhere? It is our responsibility to go invite them back in. And when they come back in, what does the guy do? He throws a party. Let us celebrate the one that has come home. The next, Jesus tells a short parable about a woman with ten coins who loses one of them. And he describes how she went looking all over the house until she found that lost coin. And she calls her friends and neighbors over to rejoice in this lost coin that was found. And then the chapter goes on one of my most favorite stories in the Bible, the story of the prodigal son. His son took his father's money, his inheritance, and he left and he said, I can do it better on my own. I don't need to be here. He left home and he squandered every blessing that God had put in his life. If that's not a message for the young people and the folks in their 20s and 30s that have left church with, with gifts and skills and callings that God has put on them and they, 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 they've squandered those things. Church, we've got to be a place that they can come home to. And we've got to do just like the father did in his story. The, the, the son comes in to beg for forgiveness and, and say, listen, just let me be a servant in your house. But, but the father says, no, you're not a servant. Here is my robe. Here's a ring. We're going to kill the fatty calf. We're going to celebrate the fact that you are back and that you are home and that God has restored you. He throws him a party. Can I tell you that God is in the business of finding lost people and then celebrating their return? Some of us here today, if we were completely honest with each other, we would say, listen, I was one of those completely lost people. I had no future. I had no hope. Death, hell, the grave, jail, that was my future. But somebody cared enough for me to say those three words. Come and see. Come and see. And then I met a Christ that radically changed my life. When, when, when Christ, when I met Christ, when I met God, He made me part of His family. He made me part of His family. Now, before we get too far here, I'm going to say that God calls people on his own. He does. We hear those stories. People driving by the church and they hear something in them that says you need to get saved and they come in and get saved. God does that. But his chosen method is you and me. His chosen method is for us to develop a relationship with somebody that doesn't know Christ and bring them in. This is the, the biblical witness, the story of the Bible. This is how it's done most often. <clears throat> so if the Bible makes it so clear how important it is for even one lost person to be found and brought to Christ, and the example of Jesus' disciples tell us that, that, that people who meet Jesus are expected to go out and find others who don't yet know him, why is this so hard for us to do? 
Why is it that we are continually seeking out other people who don't know Jesus Christ, telling them about who he is, and then inviting them to a place where they can be? I want to show you some statistics. You guys know I love statistics. Hence, probably why I'm a big baseball fan, which baseball season starts in two weeks. According to surveys, 82% of the unchurched people are at least somewhat likely to attend church if somebody invites them. 82%. A study uh, including more than 15,000 adults, and when you're doing surveys, the more people you interview, the more accurate the survey is. So if you, if you read a survey on, on the news and they say we interviewed 500 people, I don't tend to trust that. But when they say, listen, we talked to 15,000 people, it's an accurate survey. They revealed that about two-thirds of people are willing to receive information about a local church from a family member, and 56% are willing to receive information about a local church from a friend, or neighbor. A, a survey from Lifeway Research, which is the research arm of the Baptist Church, showed that many would respond to an invitation from a friend or acquaintance, 41%, from their children, if your mom and dad are in church, 25%, or another adult family member, 25%. So that's good numbers. That's good news, right? If I go and invite the statistics tell me that somebody's going to come with me. Here's the problem, though. Seven out of ten church people never invite somebody to church. Seven out of ten never say, let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. Only 2% of church members invite an unchurched person to church. And within a calendar year, only 2%. So that means 98% of churchgoers never extend an invitation to anybody to come to church with them. According to uh, Steve back there, we've got about 108 people here this morning. Good number. That means that three of us this week will invite somebody to church. Think about that. Three of us will invite somebody to church. What will the other 105 do? We'll talk about vacuum cleaners and trucks, blenders. Maybe you need to try that new coffee at Starbucks. But we won't talk about their eternal soul. So little is required of us as children of the king. So we were told to just simply share our faith and ask people to come and see for yourself who Jesus Christ is. Come and see this message for yourself. So why is this message so important? Why did God choose this way to draw people? I think that there are about three reasons, and I'm going to try to push these fast. The first reason that God wants you to invite somebody to come to church and then meet them at the door is that it helps to tear down this barrier of fear. Is there anything more scary than the first day at a new school? Think back to those days when you were a kid. You moved, you changed. Even a new year, you're going from junior high to high school, or the elementary school to junior high. You don't know what to expect. You, you don't know. There's this, there's this fear. Are the people there going to accept me? When, when I walk in the door, is somebody going to read the list of my sins and call me out? Are they going to do weird things? But when you invite somebody, it helps tear down that barrier of fear. The second thing it does by us inviting somebody, it acknowledges their worth to us. 
But even more importantly, it reminds them of their worth to God. When you care enough from, about somebody to say, listen, I'm willing to risk our friendship to tell you that Jesus Christ loves you. I, I think that's an amazing act of courage, and it's also an amazing act of love. This is what Jesus has done in my life, and I want to share this with you. The third thing, we actively participate in God's kingdom work. I have people tell me all the time, well, Pastor, I, I don't, I don't want to be involved in church because I don't have any talent, or I don't have any skill, or I can't do that, I can't sing, I can't play the piano, I can't uh, teach, I, I can't, I can't, I can't. And I say, I know one thing you can do, you can talk. <laughs> Go tell somebody about Jesus. Go for three things. The fourth thing, we allow the Holy Spirit to increase our faith by seeing Him work through everyday experiences. One of my favorite verses in, in Revelation that overcome the enemy through the blood and the power of the testimony. Your unique story. Your story. Not my story, not Meg's story, not Daryl's story. Your story. Is what somebody needs to hear to bring them to Jesus Christ. Your story. This is what God has done for me. This is the things that have happened in my life since I became a believer. This is how Jesus shows his love for me. There are two things that are consistently taught in the uh, New Testament. Otherness and outreach. I love that word, otherness. In the kingdom of God, it's not about me. It's not about you. Everything we say and do should point to the truth of Jesus Christ, who he is, what he has done for us. It, it, should, it should point to the cross and the blood that was shed on that cross. It should point to what he's doing in our lives now, the areas that he's growing us in, and, and the, the areas that he's challenging us to be better. And the second thing is outreach. The primary purpose of the church is to reach outside the church. I love our sanctuary. And man, I'm, I'm excited. I think the painting looks great. I'm excited in the next couple of weeks as we finish working through the platform and we, we're going to put a cross up in the middle of the baptistry and we're going to move the projectors over to the side so we, the cross will be lit. We'll be able to see it well through worship. To focus on the cross. I'm excited about what's going on in this building. But this building isn't why we're here. Amen. Amen. This building isn't our focus. This building isn't our purpose. Now as stewards of God's gifts, we should take care of this building. Don't misunderstand that. But our focus has got to be the people all around us. Got to invite them to church. But sometimes we lose sight of those things, don't we? We lose sight of Jesus Christ and we lose sight of this concept of outreach. Now I want you to take just a moment and think about that day that you first got saved. Maybe, maybe you were a kid. Andrea got saved in the delivery room. She served the Lord right after she drew her first breath. She got saved, and that's all she's ever known. For the rest of us, it happened a little bit later. No, the truth is, I think she was three or four. So yeah, she lived a hard life those first 36 months. <laughs> But then she, she got it together. But for the rest of us, we were older. Maybe some of us were in our teens, 20s, 30s. Remember that excitement that you felt? Because at that point, you started to understand the weight of the sin in your life. 
And when that weight was gone, you couldn't hardly stand it. You had to go share it with somebody else. There was this joy and this excitement that bubbled up in, in your life, and you had to go share it. Don't you want to reclaim that experience this morning? Reclaim that joy? Reclaim that excitement? Don't you want to be a soul in it for Christ? Another statistic I didn't read to you said that only 1% of Christians ever lead anybody else to the Lord. Only one, no, that's not per year, that's ever in their life. So I want to, I want to keep that excitement, keep that joy. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you say, Pastor, I've never experienced that. I, I don't know the Lord as my personal Savior. Maybe you've heard about Jesus your whole life. Maybe you've been in and out of church. Maybe you, you we get really good at playing church. And when I was a, a teenager, I could come in and raise my hands and pray in the altar and do all those churchy things and then go back out and live however I wanted to live. I, I was really good at church. I wasn't very good at being a Christian. Maybe some of you in that same group. Maybe you'll say, Pastor, I'm tired of playing the game and I want to get in, get in, get in on it. I want to be part of the team. I want to be part of Christ's family. But today is your day. So here's this. I'm going to wrap it up. When was the last time you shared your faith with someone? This is what we need to do. Colossians 4.3, Paul tells us to pray and ask God to open the door for us to share our faith. Invite somebody to the church. I want you to make this invitation specific. Don't just invite guests to some random day. Hey, look, sometime come by my church. Say, listen, on March 31st, come with me to homecoming. On April 14th, come with me on Palm Sunday. On April 21st, come with me on Easter. I will come pick you up. I will come by your house and you can follow me. Okay, second crazy preacher and I will scare you and you want to leave. You're allowed to laugh at that. Make the invitation generous. Make the invitation clear. And above all, the worst thing they can do is say no. So our ushers are going to come to you right now and they're going to give you an Easter invitation card. One card. We've been talking about this Connect 5 for the last several weeks. So everybody, go ahead and give them one card each. Pass it out, guys. On the front of it, this is picture. And on the back, it has the three services, April 14th, April 21st, and April 28th. Now what we're going to do here in just a second after they give you that card, we're going to attach a name to it. You're going to attach a name to it. One of the five people that you've been praying about that I should invite to church. And we're going to pray over this card, and we're going to pray over that person. We're going to say, God, give me an opportunity to invite whoever that name is. As a pastor, I don't run around with a lot of people that aren't church people. You know? Most, most everybody I know goes to church or pastors to church. So I go, I, I look for people. I'm in the bookstore. I walk up to somebody. Hey, my name is. I was at the bank this week depositing my check and, and taking care of some church business. And uh, the, the, the teller, she said, are you from Texas? I'm like, no, I'm not from Texas. I'm me, East Freedom. <laughs> she laughed at that. So I said, no, I'm from Georgia. We started talking. She said, what do you do? Where are you from? Or, you know, why are you here? I told her, and then I invited her to church. Church, if you have a 
desire to invite people to the church, God will give you opportunities. Talk to your pharmacist. Talk to the lady that checks you out at the grocery store, the guy that checks you out at the grocery store. Talk to your bank teller. Talk to the person that sits next to you at work. The, the person that, that you stand at the uh, bus stop with while your kids are getting on the school bus. And why the school bus driver? You got any card in your hand? Think of a name. Bob, Fred, Susie, Jane. Would you hold the card up in the air? Repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, give me the opportunity, and now I want you to say the name, to invite to be a church with me on these days. Prepare the path for me. Prepare their heart for you. I pray that the Holy Spirit will do a work in their life and that they will come to know you as the Lord and Savior. In your holy name we pray. Amen. We're going to do this every week for the next four more weeks. Pass out one part. Now, you've got seven days to go find that person that you just prayed over and give them this card. You've called their name. Made a commitment not just to them but to Jesus Christ. <coughs> Don't throw this in the bottom of your pocket. Don't throw it in the bottom of your purse. Don't throw it in the trash can when you leave the church. Their eternal soul may be waiting on this invitation. Stand with me if you will, please. <laughs> If you need special prayers, always these altars are open. I want you to know I love you. Andrea and I love you. Our kids love you. We love being here. I'm excited to see grass. <laughs> but even more importantly, I'm excited to see you and to see the things that God is doing in each of your lives. If you will bow your heads, we're going to be dismissed in prayer. Sister Nancy, would you dismiss us in prayer, please? Just already come to you.